Well, this is gonna fucking suck. It's an episode two of Wikipedia Wednesday. Alexander the Great. A nice, a nice brief page for this for this week. Um, yeah, oh, at least a whole bunch of it is uh, references. So that's not bad. Anyway, for my first recording, we're only going to get up to the conquest of the Persian Empire. Then I'll record more again later, because I'm still a little sick, so I do not feel like trying this in one go. <clears throat> All right. Let's begin with this Greek bastard. Alexander III of Macedon, commonly known as Alexander the Great, was a king of the ancient Greek kingdom of Macedon. Go figure. And a member of the Argaid dynasty. He was born in Pella in 356 BC and succeeded his father Philip II to the throne at the age of 20. He spent most of his ruling years on an unprecedented military campaign through Asia and Northeast Africa, and he created one of the largest empires of the ancient world by the age of 30, stretching from Greece to northwestern India. He was undefeated in battle and is widely considered one of history's most successful military commanders. During his youth, Alexander was tutored by Aristotle until age 16, I almost said tortured, Sort of the same thing. After Philip's assassination in 336 BC, he succeeded his father to the throne and inherited a strong kingdom and an experienced army. Alexander was awarded the generalship of Greece and used his authority to launch his father's Panhellenic project to lead the Greeks in the conquest of Persia. In 334 BC, he invaded uh, the Archimedean, Ar Archimendi, Archimendi, man, I should know this word, and I'm sure I could say it if I wasn't reading it. Fuck me. Empire, the Persian Empire, we'll go with that, and began a series of campaigns that lasted 10 years. Following the conquest of Anatolia, Alexander broke the power of Persia in a series of decisive battles, most notably the battles of Issus and Guatemala. He subsequently overthrew Persian king Darius III and conquered Achaemenid Achaemenid Empire. Achaemenid, Achaemenid Empire. That's still fucked. That's still not right. In its entirety. At that point, his empire stretched from the Adriatic Sea to the Indus River. He endeavored to reach the ends of the world and the great outer sea and invaded India in 326 BC, winning an important victory over the Paravas at the Battle of Hydaspes. He eventually turned back at the demand of his homesick troops. Alexander died in Babylon in 323 BC, the city that he planned to establish as his capital without executing a series of planned campaigns that would have begun with an invasion of Arabia. In the years following his death, a series of civil wars tore his, empire, tore his empire apart, resulting in the establishment of several states ruled by Diadochi, Alexander's surviving generals and heirs. By the Diadochi. Alex, fuck me. Literacy, right, still garbage. Alexander's legacy includes the cultural diffusion and <laughs> syncretism which his conquests endangered, such as the Greco-Buddhism, such as Greco-Buddhism. He founded some 20 cities that bore his name, most notably Alexandria and Egypt. Alexander's settlement of Greek colonists and the resulting spread of Greek culture in the East resulted in a new Hellenistic civilization, aspects of which are still evident in the traditions of the Byzantine Empire in the mid 15th century AD and the presence of Greek speakers in Central and Far East Anatolia until the 1920s. Alexander became legendary as a classical hero in the mold of Achilles, and he pre features prominently in the history and mythic traditions of both Greek and non-Greek cultures. He became the measure against which many military leaders compared themselves, and mili military academies throughout the world still teaches tactics.
He's often ranked among the most influential people in human history, which is why he made the list. Like, look how fucking long this content fucking thing is. Jesus. This guy's been dead for over 2,000 years. Like, that's ridiculous. Fucking champion of champions. I know he existed, unlike uh, some other characters. Anyway. Lineage and childhood. Alexander was born on the sixth day of the ancient Greek month. Fuck that. Which probably corresponds to July, 20th of July, 356 BC, although the exact date is disputed. In Pella, the capital of the kingdom of Macedon, he was the son of the king of Macedon, Philip II, and his fourth wife, Olympias, the daughter of Neptolemus, the Ptolemus, the first king of Epirus. Although Philip had seven or eight wives, Olympias was his principal wife, for some time, likely because she gave birth to Alexander. So is he just like born the greatest? Like that's just nuts. What a fucking mm. anyway. Several legends surround Alexander's birth and childhood. Of course they do. According to the ancient Greek biographer Plutarch, on the eve of the consummation of her marriage to Philip, Olympias dreamed that her womb was struck by a thunderbolt that caused a flame to spread far and wide before dying away. Sometime after the wedding, Philip is said to have seen himself in a dream, securing his wife's womb with a seal engraved to the lion's image. Plutarch offered a variety of interpretations of these dreams, that Olympias was pregnant before her marriage, indicating that by, seal, by the sealing of her womb, or that Alexander, his father, was Zeus. Ancient commentators were divided about whether the ambitious Olympias promulgated the story of Alexander's divine parentage, variously claiming that she had told Alexander or that she dismissed the suggestion as impious. Impi Fuck me, impious, impious. See how illiterate I fucking am? Isn't it embarrassing? Anyway, on the day Alexander was born, Philip was preparing a siege on the city of Pot Potidia on the peninsula of uh, Chalcidice. Chalcidice. That same day, Philip received news that his general, Parmenian, had defeated a combined Illyrian and Pannonian armies, and that his horses had won at the Olympic Games. Uh, see, he's as old as the Olympics. Okay. It's not right. It was said that on this day, the temple of Artemis in Eph Eph Ephesus one of the seven wonders of the world burnt down. This led to Hegesis of Magnesia to say that it had burnt down because Artemis was away, was away, attending the birth of Alexander. Such legends have emerged when Alexander was king, and possibly at his own instigation, to show that he was superhuman and destined for greatness from, con from conception. In his early years, Alexander was raised by a nurse, Lenique, sister of Alexander's future general, Cletius the Black. Later in his childhood, Alexander was tutored by the strict Leonidas, a relative of his mother, and by... And by... <laughs> fuck me, man. I hate the Greeks. That's not true. They're pretty sweet. Lysmachus of Arcania. Pretty sure I missed an N in there. Alexander was raised in the manner of noble Macedonian youths, learning to read, play the lyre, ride, fight, and hunt. When Alexander was ten years old, a trader from Thessaly brought Philip a horse, which he offered to sell for thirteen talents. The horse refused to be mounted, and Philip ordered it away. Alexander, however, detecting the horse's fear of its own shadow, asked to tame the horse, which he eventually managed. Plutarch stated that Philip, overjoyed at the dis display of courage and ambition, kissed his son tearfully, declaring, My boy, you must find a kingdom big enough for your ambitions. Macedon is too small for you. And, brought the horse, and bought the horse for him. Alexander named it Busaf <laughs> uh, Busaphilus, meaning ox head. Busaphilus carried Alexander as far as India, when the horse died because of old age, according to Plutarch. At the age of 30, 
Alexander named a city after him. Bucephia. Bucephala. Bucep fuck me. Am I saying it wrong the whole time in there? Uh, anyway. Adolescence and education. When Alexander was 13. We're only really at 13? What? When Alexander was at 13, Philip began to search for a tutor considered and considered such academics as Isocrates and Sept... Sepuses. <laughs> Fuck me. Fuck you, Greeks. Have normal names. I guess they are normal for Greeks. The latter offering to resign, offering to resign to take up the post. Philip chose Aristotle and provided the Temple of Nymphs at Misa as a classroom. In return for teaching Alexander, Philip agreed to rebuild Aristotle's hometown of Stegaria. What? which Philip had raised, and to repopulate it by buying and feeding the ex-citizens who were slaves or pirating those who were in exile. Aristotle just got like a hundred times cooler. Added to the list. <laughs> what a fucking deal. Misa was like a bordering school. Misa was like a boarding school for Alexander and, the 13, and 13 of Macedonian nobles, such as Ptolemy, Hephaestion, and Cassander. Many of these students would become his friends and future generals, and are often known as, his, as the Companions. Aristotle taught, taught Alexander and his companions about medicine, philosophy, morals, religion, logic, and art. Under Aristotle's tutelage, Alexander developed a passion for the works of Homer, in particular the Iliad. Aristotle gave him an anecdote annotated, annotated fuck me. <laughs> Aristotle gave him an annotated copy, which Alexander later carried on his campaigns. Philip Sayer. Jeez, so much left. <sighs> Regency and Ascension of Macedon. At age 16, Alexander's education under Aristotle ended. Philip waged war against Byzantium, Byzantium leaving Alexander in charge as the regent and his heir apparent. During Philip's absence, the Thracian Mede revolted against Macedonia. Alexander responded quickly, driving them from their territory. He colonized it with Greeks and founded the city named Alexandropolis. Upon Philip's return, he dispatched Alexander with a small force to subdue revolts in the southern Thrace, Thrace campaigning against the Greek city Corinthus. Alexander is reported to have served his father's life, saved his father's life. Meanwhile, the city of Amphissa began to work lands that were sacred to, to Apollo near Delphi, a sacrilege that gave Philip the opportunity to further intervene in Greek affairs. Still occupied in Thrace, he ordered Alexander to muster an army for a campaign in southern Greece, concerned that other Greek states might intervene. Alexander made it look as though he was preparing to attack Illyria instead. During this turmoil, the Illyrians invaded Macedonia, only to be repelled by Alexander. Philip and his army joined his son in 338 BC, and they marched through Thermopylae. Th Thermop fuck that. Taking it after stubborn resistance from its Theban gar garrison. Theban garrison. They went on to occupy the city of Aladia, only a few days' march from both Athens and Thebes. The Athonians, led by Demosthenes, <laughs> voted to seek alliance with the Thebes against Macedonia. Both Athens and Philip sent, embassy, sent embassies to win Thebes' favor, but Athens won the contest. Philip marched on Amphysia, ostensibly acting on the request of uh, the... Amphiton, uh, Amphitionic League, Amphitionic League, fuck me, capturing the mercenaries sent there by Demothenes and acting the city and accepting the city's surrender. Philip then returned, returned to Latia, Latia, sending a final offer of peace to Athens and Thebes, who both rejected it. Dummies. As Philip marched south, his opponents blocked him near Genaria Boetia. During the ensuing Battle of Cheronia, <laughs> look at all those fucking vowels. Look at these vowels. It's just Jesus Christ. 
Philip commanded the right wing and Alexander the left, accompanied by a group of Philip's trusted generals. According to the ancient sources, the two sides fought bitterly for some time. Philip deliberately commanded his troops to retreat, counting on the untested Athenian hoplites to follow, thus breaking their line. Alexander was the first to break the Theban lines, followed by Philip's generals. Having damaged the enemy's cohesion, Philip ordered his troops to press forward and quickly routed them. With the Athenians lost, the Thebans were surrounded. Left, alone, left to fight alone, they were defeated. After the victory at Chinoria, Philip and Alexander marched unopposed into the Peloponnese. Peloponnese. Welcomed by all cities, however. Ha welcomed by all cities. However, when they reached Sparta, they were refused, but did not resort to war. Probably smart. At Corinth, Philip established a Hellenic alliance, modeled on the old anti-Persian alliance of the Greco-Persian Wars, which included most Greek city-states except Sparta. Philip was then named Hegemon, often translates as Supreme Commander of this League, known by modern scholars as the League of Corinth, and announced his plans to attack the Persian Empire. I guess I uh, had to lead by example for that whole find somewhere that can hold your ambitions. Exile and Return when Philip returned to, returned to Pella, he fell in love and married Cleopatra Eudice, a, a niece of his general, Adelus. The marriage made Alexander's position in, as heir less secure, since any son Cleopatra Eudice, of Cleopatra Eudice would be a fully Macedonian heir, while Alexander was only half Macedonian. During the wedding banquet, a drunken Adelus publicly prayed to the gods that the union would produce a legitimate heir. At the wedding of Cleopatra, whom Philip fell in love with and married, she being much too young for him, her uncle Adelus, in his drink, desired the Macedonians would implore the gods to give them a lawful successor to the kingdom by, by his niece. This so irritated Alexander that throwing one of the cups at his head, you villain, he said, what, what am I then, a bastard? Then Philip, ta taking Adelus's part, rose up and would have, his son run, would have run his son through. But by good fortune for them both, either his over-hasty age or the wine he had drunk, he, his foot slipped so that he fell down on the floor, at which Alexander reproachfully insulted over him. See there, said he, the man who makes preparations to pass out of Europe into Asia, overturned in passing from one seat to another. Plutarch describing the feud at Philip's wedding. Sounds like an exciting party. I wish I, I wish I saw that. Another reason somebody needs to make like a, a maybe not a time machine, but like a, a time window. That'd be cool. I guess movies are as close to that as we get, hey? Alexander fled Macedon with his mother, dropping her off with her brother, King Alexander I of Epirius, in Dodona, capital of the Mol Molossians. He continued to Illyria, where he sought refuge with the Illyrian king and was treated as a guest, despite having defeated them in battle a few years before. However, it appears Philip never intended to disown his politically and militarily trained son. Accordingly, Alexander returned to Macedon after six months due to the efforts of a family friend, Demaratus, who mediated between the two parties. In the following year, the Persians satrap of Caria, Pixidarius, Pixidarius, offered his eldest daughter to Alexander's half-brother, Philip Aridifdeus. Olympias and several of Alexander's friends suggested this showed Philip intended to make Eridaeus his heir. Alexander reacted by sending an actor, Thessalus to, of Corinth, to tell Pixidarius that he should not offer his daughter's hand to an illegitimate son, but instead to Alexander. When Philip heard of this, he stopped the negotiations and scolded Alexander for wishing to marry the daughter of a Carian, explaining that he wanted a better bride for him. Philip exiled four of Alexander's friends, Har <laughs> Harpalus, Nearchus, Ptolemy, and Erigius, and had the Corinthians bring Theseus to, his to him in chains. 
Ooh. Being, being a rebel and growing up back in the day sounds way more extreme. King of Macedon. Ascension. In the summer of 336 BC, while at the IGA, IGA, I, well, the IGA, while at the, fuck it, attending the wedding of his daughter Cleopatra to Olympias' brother Alexander I of Epi, Epirus, Philip was assassinated by the captain of his bodyguards, Pausanias. As Pausanias tried to escape, he tripped over a vine and was killed by his pursuers, including two of Alexander's companions, per Perdiccas and Leonatus. Alexander was proclaimed king on the spot by the nobles and army at the age of 20. Oh. And the fucking... And the curve turns. Consolidation of power. Alexander began his reign by eliminating potential rivals to the throne. He had his cousin, the former Amintas IV, executed. He also had two Macedonian princes from the region of Lincestus killed, but spared a third, Alexander Lincestus. <laughs> I wonder why. Olympias said Cleopatra Eudais of Europa, her daughter by Philip, burned alive. When Alexander learned about this, he was furious. Well, at least he has some lines. Alexander also ordered the murder of Attalus, who was in command of the advance guard of the armor in Asia Minor and Cleopatra's uncle. Attalus was at that time corresponding with huh, Demoth Demosthenes regarding the possibility of defecting to Athens. Attalus also had severely insulted Alexander. And following Cleopatra's murder, Alexander may have considered him too dangerous to leave alive. Alexander spared Eridaeus, who, was, who by, was by all accounts mentally disabled, possibly as a result of poisoning by Olympias. News of Philip's death roused many states into revolt, including Thebes, Athens, Thessaly, and the Thracian tribes north of Macedon. When news of the revolts reached Alexander, he responded quickly. Though advised to use diplomacy, Alexander mustered 3,000 Macedonian cavalry and rode south towards Thessaly. He found the Thess Thessalian army occupying the pass between Mount Olympus and Mount Osa. He ordered his men to ride over Mount Osa, when the, Thessians, oh, this, when the Thessalians awoke the next day, they found Alexander in their rear and promptly surrendered, adding their cavalry to Alexander's force. He then continued south towards Penoponese. Penop Penop Alexander stopped at Thermopylae, where he was recognized as the leader of the Amphitionic League before heading south to Corinth. Athens sued for peace, and Alexander pardoned the rebels. The famous encounter between Alexander and Di Diogene, of, uh, Diogene the Cynic occurred during Ath Alexander's stay in Corinth. When Alexander asked Diogene fuck that, what he could do for him, the philosopher disdainfully asked Alexander to stand a little to the side as he was blocking the sunlight. This reply apparently decided, delighted Alexander. Uh, Alexander who is reported to have said, but verily, if I were not Alexander, I would like to be Diogenes. Diogenes, Diogenes fuck me. See, what, ah. At Corinth, Alexander took the title of hegemon, and like Philip, was appointed commander for the coming war against Persia. He also received news of a Thracian uprising. Balkan Campaign before crossing to Asia, Alexander wanted to safeguard his northern borders. In the spring of 335 BC, he advanced to surpass several revolts. Starting from Amphipolis, he traveled east to the, into the country of the independent Thracians. And at Mount Hamas, the Macedonian army attacked and defeated the Thracian forces, manning the heights. With the forces manning the heights. Man, I got it. The Thracians marched into the country of Tribali, Triboli, and defeated their army near the Liginus River, a tributary of the Danube. Alexander then marched for three days to the Danube, encountering the, J the Jitai tribe at the opposite shore. Crossing the river at night, he surprised them and forced their army to retreat after the first cavalry skirmish. 
News then reached Alexander that Clidius, king of Illyria, and king Glacius of the Talunti were in open revolt against his authority. Marching west to Illyria, Alexander defeated each in turn, forcing two rulers to flee with their troops. With these victories, he secured his northern frontier. While Alexander campaigned north, the Thebians and Athenians rebelled once again. Alexander immediately headed south. While the other cities again hesitated, Thebes decided to fight. The Thebian resistance was ineffective, and Alexander raised the city and divided its territory between the other Bodian, Boeotian cities. The end of Thebes cowed Athens, leaving all Greece temporarily at peace. Alexander then set out on his Asia campaign, leaving Antipater as regent. And I will record conquest of the Persian Empire a little bit later. And we're going to keep going. Conquest of the Persian Empire. Asia Minor. Alexander's army crossed the Hellespont in 334 BC with approximately 48,100 soldiers, 6,100 cavalry, and a fleet of 120 ships with crews numbering 38,000, drawn from Macedon and various Greek city-states. Mercenaries and feudally raised soldiers from Thrace, per uh, Paeonia, and Illyria. He showed his intent to conquer the entirety of the Persian Empire by throwing a spear into Asian soil and saying he accepted Asia as a gift from the gods. This also showed Alexander's eagerness to fight, in contrast to his father's preference for diplomacy. After an initial victory against the Persian forces at the Battle of Grace Granicus, Alexander accepted the surrender of the Persian provincial capital and treasury of Sardis. He then proceeded along the Ionian coast, granting autonomy and democracy to the cities. Miletus, held by Archimedes forces, required a delicate siege operation with Persian naval forces nearby. Further south at Helicarnassus in uh, Caria, Alexander successfully waged his first large-scale siege, eventually forcing his, his opponents, the mercenary captain Memnon of Rhodes and, Persian and the Persian satrap of Caria, Arantanobates, to withdraw by sea. Alexander left the great sea of Caria to a member of the Hecta... Hecatominid dynasty, Ada, who adopted Alexander. From Helicarnassus, Alexander proceeded to, into mountainous Lycia and Pamphylian, Pamphylian plains, in the Pamphylian plains, asserting control over all the coastal cities to deny the Persians naval bases. From Polyphia, Pamlif, Pamphylia onwards, the coast held no major ports, and Alexander moved inland. At, Termo at Termos Termisos, Alexander humbled but did not storm the Pisidian city. At the ancient Fuck Greek Pharyngian capital Gordium, Alexander undid the, un the hitherto unsolvable Gordian knot a feat said to await the future king of Asia. According to the story, Alexander proclaimed that it did not matter how the knot was undone and hacked it apart with his sword. Well, and thus foreshadowed how he was going to become the king of Asia. The Levant and Syria. In spring 33 B 333 BC, Alexander crossed the Ter Taurus into Sicily, Cilicia, Cilicia. After a long pause due to illness, he marched towards Syria. Though outmaneuvered by Darius, signific by Darius's significantly larger army, he marched back to Cilicia, where he defeated Darius at Isis. Darius fled battle, causing his army to collapse, and left behind his wife, his two daughters, his mother, Sissy Gambus, and a fabulous treasure. He offered a peace tre treaty that included the lands he had already lost and a ransom of 10,000 talents for his family 
Alexander replied that since he was now king of Asia, it was he alone who decided territorial divisions. Alexander proceeded to take possession of Syria and most of the coast of the Levant. In the following year, 332 BC, he was forced to attack Tyre, where he was cap where he captured, which he captured after a long diff and difficult siege. The men of military age were massacred, and the women and children sold into slavery. Better tear down all the Alexander statues. Egypt. When Alexander destroyed Tyre, many of the towns on the route to Egypt quickly capitulated. However, Alexander met with resistance at Gaza. <laughs> the stronghold was heavily fortified and built on a hill, requiring a siege. When his engineers pointed out to him that because of the height of the mound, it would be impossible, this encouraged Alexander all the more to make the attempt. After three unsuccessful attempts, the stronghold fell, but not before Alexander had received a serious shoulder wound. As in Tyre, men of military age were put to the sword, and the women and children were sold into slavery. Alexander advanced on Egypt in later 332 BC, where he was regarded as a liberator. He was pronounced son of the deity Amun at the oracle of Siwa Oasis in the Libyan desert. Henceforth, Alexander often referred to Zeus Amun as his true father. After his death, currency depicted him adorned with ram's horns as a symbol of his divinity. During his stay in Egypt, he founded Alexandria by Egypt, which would become the prosperous capital of the Ptolemaic kingdom after his death. Assyria and Babylon Leaving Egypt in 331 BC, Alexander marched eastward into Mesopotamia, now northern Iraq, and again defeated Darius at the Battle of uh, Gagamela. Darius once more fled the field, and Alexander chased him as far as Arab Arbella. Gagamela would be the final and decisive encounter between the two. Darius fled over the mountains to Ek Ekban Batana, modern Hamidan, <laughs> Hamidan, while Alexander captured Babylon. Persia. Persia. That was weird. From Babylon, Alexander went to Susa, one of the Achaemenid capitals, and captured his, its treasury. He sent the bulk of his army to the Persian ceremonial capital of Paris, Perso, 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 Persepolis. <laughs> Fuck myself. Via the Persian royal guard. Alexander, took him, Alexander himself took selected troops on the direct route to the, north, to the city. He then stormed the pass of the Persian gates in the modern Zagros Mountains, which had been blocked by a Persian army under Ariobas Barzanes, and then hurried to Persepolis before its garrison could loot the treasury. On entering Persepolis, Alexander entered his, allowed his troops to loot the city for several days. Alexander stayed in Persepolis for five months. During his stay, a fire broke out in the eastern palace of Xerxes I and spread to the rest of the city. Possible causes included a drunken accident or deliberate revenge for the burning of the Acropolis of Athens during the Second Persian War by Xerxes. Years later, upon revisiting the city he had burnt, Alexander regretted the burning of Persepolis. Plutarch recounts an anecdote in which Alexander pauses and talks of a fallen statue of Xerxes as if it were a live person. Shall I pass by and leave you lying there because of the expeditions you led against Greece? Or shall I set upon you again because of your magnanimity and your virtues in other respects? Fall of the Empire and the East Alexander then chased Darius first into Med Media and then into Parthia. The Persian king no longer controlled his own destiny and was taken prisoner by Bessus his Bactarian satrap and king kinsman. As Alexander appro approached, Bessus had his men fatally stabbed the great king and then declared himself Darius's successor as Al Ar Artaxerxes IV before retreating into Central Asia to launch a guerrilla campaign against Alexander. 
Alexander buried Darius's remains next to his Archimedes predecessors in a regal funeral. He claimed that while dying, Darius had named him as his successor to the Achaemenid Ech- throne. The Achaemenid Empire is normally considered to have fallen with Darius. Alexander viewed Bessus as a usurper and set out to defeat him. This campaign, initially against Bessus, turned, against, turned into a grand tour of Central Asia. Alexander founded a series of new series, cities, all called Alexandria, sounds like George Foreman, including modern Kandahar in Afghanistan, in Alexandria Eschat, the furthest in modern Tajikistan. The campaign took Alexander through Media, Parthia, area, West Afghanistan, Drangia, Drangiana, Arachosia, southern and central Afghanistan, Bactri- Bactria, northern and central Afghanistan, and Scythia. Sp- <laughs> Spitamines, who, who held an undefined position in the, uh, in the satrap of Sogdiana, in 329 BC, betrayed Bessus to Ptolemy, one of Alexander's trusted companions, and Bessus was executed. However, when at some point later Alexander was on the Chextartes, dealing with an incursion by, his, by a nomad army, by a horse nomad army, Spitan, St- Spitamenes raised Sogdiana in a revolt. Alexander personally defeated the Scythians at the Battle of Jexartes and immediately launched a campaign against Spitamis, Spitamias, Spitamines, Jesus, blah, 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 blah. defeating him in the Battle of Gabia, Gabe. After the defeat, Spitamines was killed by his own men, who then sued for peace. I love suing for peace. That always sounds just great. Problems and plots. During this time, Alexander adopted some elephants, some elephants, some elements of Persian dress and custom at his court, notably the custom of proskinesis, either a symbolic kissing of the hand or prostration unto the ground, the Persians showed to their social superiors. The Greeks regarded the gesture as the provinces of deities and believed that Alexander meant to deify himself by requiring it. This cost him the sympathies of many of his countrymen, and he eventually abandoned it. A plot against his life was revealed, and one of his officers, Philotus, was executed for failing to alert Alexander. The death of the son necessitated the death of the father, and thus Parmenion, who had been charged with guarding the treasury of Ectabatana, was assassinated by Alexander's command to prevent attempts at vengeance. Most infamously, Alexander personally killed the man who had saved his life at Granicus, Cletius the Black, during a violent drunken altercation at Marakanda, modern-day Samarkand in Uzbekistan, in which Cletius accused Alexander of several judgments, judgmental mistakes, and most especially having forgotten the Macedonian ways in favor of corrupt Oriental lifestyle. Later in the Central Asian campaign, A second plot against his life was revealed, and this one instigated by one of his royal pages. His official historian, Callisthenes of Olynthus, was implicated in the plot, and in the Anabasis of Alexander, Arian states that Callisthenes and the pages were then tortured on the rack as punishment, and likely died soon after. It remains unclear if Callisthenes was actually involved in the plot, for prior to his accusation he had fallen out of favor by leading the opposition to the attempt to introduce proskinesis. I cannot say that without hearing it. Macedon and Alexander's absence. When Alexander set out for Asia, he left his general, Antipater, an experienced military and political leader and part of Philip II's old guard in charge of Macedon. Alexander's sacking of Thebes ensured that Greece remained quiet during his absence. The one exception was a call to arms by Spartan king Aegis III in 331 BC, whom Antipater defeated and killed in the Battle of Megalopolis. 
Megalopolis. Antipater referred, referred the Spartans' punishment to the League of Corinth, which then deferred to Alexander, who chose to pardon them. There was also considerable friction between Antipater and Olympias, and each complained to Alexander about the other. In general, Greece had enjoyed a period of peace and prosperity during Alexander's campaign in Asia. Alexander sent back vast sums from his conquest, which stimulated the economy and increased trade across his empire. However, Alexander's constant demand for troops and the migration of Macedonians throughout his empire depleted Macedonians' manpower, greatly weakening it in the years after Alexander and ultimately led to its subjugation by Rome. Indian Campaign Forays into the Indian Subcontinent After the death of Spitamenes and his marriage to Roxana, Roshanav, an old Iranian, to, yeah, okay, screw that, to cement relations with his new satrapies, Alexander turned to the Indian Subcontinent. He invited the chieftains of the former satrapy of Gandhar, a region, Kandahara, presented, a region presently straddling eastern Afghanistan and northern Pakistan, to come to him and submit to his authority. Omphis, Indian name MP, the ruler of Taxila, Taxila whose kingdom extended from the Indus to the Hydapes, Chalam, complied, but the chieftains of some hill clans, including the Aspesoli and the Askenoi sections of the Cambojas, known in Indian text also as Ashvayanas and Ashvik. Holy shit! <laughs> I hate this part. Refused to submit. Ambadi hastened to relieve Alexander of his apprehension and met him with valuable presents, placing himself and all his forces at his disposal. Alexander not only returned Ambi his title, and the gifts, but he also presented him with a wardrobe of Persian robes, gold and silver ornaments, thirty horses, and a thousand talents in gold. Alexander was emboldened to divide his forces, and Ambassy assisted Hephaestion and per Perdiccas in constructing a bridge over the Indus, where it, where it bends at Hund, supplied by at Hund, supplied their troops with provisions, and received Alexander himself and his whole army in his capital city of Texila, with every demonstration of friendship and the most liberal hospitality. On the subsequent advance of the Macedonian king, Texiles, accompanied with a force of 5,000 men, took part in the battle of the <laughs> Hydapes River. After that victory, he was sent by Alexander in pursuit of Porus, to whom he was charged to offer favorable terms, but narrowly escaped losing his life at the hands of his old enemy. Subsequently, however, the two rivals were reconciled by a personal mediation of Alexander, and Taxiles, after having contributed zealously to the equipment and fleet of the Hydapes, was entrusted by the king, of the king with the government of the whole territory between the river and the Indus. A considerable accession of power was granted him after the death of Philip, son of Machetes, and he was allowed to retain his authority at the death of Alexander himself as well as in the subsequent partition of the provinces at tri trip Tripadarius. <laughs> 321 BC. In the winter of 327-326 BC, Alexander personally led a campaign against these clans, the Aspesoi of the Kunar Valleys and the Gererians of the Gererias Valley and, and the Asakenoi of the S Watt and Burner Valleys, Booner Valleys. A fierce, ah? a fierce contest ensued with the Espinoi, in which Alexander was wounded in the shoulder by a dart, but eventually the Espinoi, Espisoi, lost. Alexander then faced the es Asakinoi, who fought in the strongholds of Masaga, Ora, and Aeronos. The fort of Masaga was reduced only after days of bloody fighting, in which Alexander was wounded seriously in the ankle. According to Curtius, 
Not only did Alexander slaughter the entire population of Masaga, but also did he reduce its buildings to rubble. A similar slaughter occurred at Orna, Ora. In the aftermath of Masaga and Ora, numerous Asakanaeans fled to the fortress of Eornos. Alexander followed close behind and captured a strategic hill fort after four bloody days. After Eornos, Alexander crossed the Indus and fought and won an epic battle against King Porus, who ruled a region lying between the Hydapes and the Asininis, Chinab, in what is now the Punjab, in the Battle of Hydaspes in 326 BC. Alexander was impressed by Porus' bravery and made him an ally. He appointed Porus as a satrap and attended to Porus' territory and added to Porus' territory land that he did not previously own, towards the southeast of the Hephaestus. Choosing a local Choosing a local helped him control these lands so distant from Greece. Alexander founded two cities on opposite sides of the Hydapes River, naming one Pusaphela in honor of his horse who died around this time. The other was Nike, Victory, thought to be located at the site of the modern-day Mong Punjab. Revolt of the Army East of Porus Kingdom, near the Ganges River, where Nanda, the Nanda Empire of Mag Magadha, the furthest east of the Gangari Empire of the modern-day Bengal region of the Indian subcontinent. Fearing the prospect of facing other large armies and exhausted by years of campaigning, Alexander's army mutinied at the Hephaestus River, refusing to march further east. This river thus marks the easternmost extent of Alexander's conquests. As for the Macedonians, however, their struggle with Porus blunted their courage and stayed their further advance into the India, for having had all they could do to repulse an enemy who mustered only 20,000 infantry and 2,000 horse, they violently opposed Alexander when he insisted on crossing the river Ganges, Ganges also, the width of which, as they learned, was 32 furlongs, in its depth 100 fathoms, while its banks on the furthest side were covered with multitudes of men-at-arms and, horse and elephant, horsemen and elephants, for they were told that the king of the Gandariites and Persiae were arrayed, waiting them with 80,000 horsemen, 200,000 footmen, 80,000 chariots, and 60,000 war elephants. Alexander tried to persuade his soldiers to march further, but his general, Coronus, pleaded with him to change his opinion and return. The men, he said, longed to again see their parents, their wives and children, their homeland. Alexander eventually agreed and turned south, marching along the Indus. Along the way, his army conquered the Malhi in modern-day Multan and under their Indian tribes, and Alexander sustained an injury during the siege. Alexander sent much of his army to Carmenia, modern and southern Iran, with General uh, Craterius, and commissioned a fleet to explore the Persian Gulf shore under his admiral Nearchus, while he led the rest back to Persia through the more difficult southern route along the Gredorsian desert of Makran. Alexander reached Susa in 324 BC, but not before losing many men to the harsh desert. Last years in Persia. Discovering that many of his satraps and military governors had misbehaved in his absence, Alexander executed several of them as examples on his way to Susa. As a gesture of thanks, he paid off the debts of his soldiers and announced that he would send overaged and disbanded veterans back to Macedon, led by Craterius. His troops misunderstood his intention and mutinied at the town of Opus. They refused to be sent away and criticized the adoption of Persian customs and dress at the introduction of Persian officers and soldiers into Macedonian units. After three days, unable to persuade his men to back down, Alexander gave Persians command posts in the army and conferred Macedonian military titles upon Persian units. The Macedonians quickly paid forgiveness, for which Alexander accepted and held a great banquet for several thousand of his men at which they ate to get, he and they ate together. In an attempt to craft a lasting harmony between his Macedonian and Persian subjects, Alexander held a mass marriage of his senior officers to Persian and other noble women at Susa. But few of those marriages 
seemed to have lasted much beyond a year. Meanwhile, upon his return to Persia, Alexander learned that the guards at the tomb of Cyrus the Great in Pasargarde had desecra desecrated it and swiftly executed them. Alexander admired Cyrus the Great from an early age regarding Z Xenophon's Crepodia, which described Cyrus's heroism in battle and governments as, as a king and legislator. During his visit, his visit to Pisargade, Alexander ordered his architect Aristobulus to decorate the interior of the sepulchral <laughs> sepulchr chamber in Cyrus's tomb. I can't even fucking try that one. Afterwards, Alexander traveled to Ecbatana to retrieve the bulk of the Persian treasure. There, his closest friend and possible lover, Hephaestion, died of illness or poisoning. Hephaestion's death devastated Alexander, and he ordered the preparation of it as an expensive funeral pyre in Babylon, as well as a decree for public mourning. Back in Babylon, Alexander planned a series of new campaigns, beginning with the invasion of Arabia, but he would not have a chance to realize them, as he died shortly thereafter. Death in Succession on either the 10th or 11th of June, 323 BC, Alexander died in the palace of ne Nebuchadnezzar II in Babylon at age 32. There are two different versions of Alexander's death and details of the death differ slightly in each. Plutarch's account is that roughly 14 days before his death, Alexander entertained Ad Admiral Nearchus and spent the night and the next day drinking with Midias of Lar Larissa. He developed a fever which worsened until he was unable to speak. The common soldiers, anxious about health, were granted the right to file past him as he silently waved at them. In the second account, D Diodorus recounted that Alexander was struck with pain after downing a large bowl of unmixed wine in honor of Hercules, followed by eleven days of weakness. He did not develop a fever and died in, after some agony. Arian also mentioned this as an alternative, but Plutarch specifically denied this claim. Given the propensity of the Macedonian aristocracy to assassination, foul play featured in multiple accounts of, the de of his death. Diodorus, Plutarch, Arian, and Justin all mentioned the theory that Alexander was poisoned. Justin stated that Alexander was the victim of a poisoning conspiracy. Plutarch dismissed it as fabrication, while both Diodorus and Arian were noted that they mentioned it only for the sake of completeness. The accounts were nevertheless fairly consistent in designating Antipater, recently removed as Macedonian viceroy, and at odds with Olympias as the head of the alleged plot, perhaps taking his summons to Babylon as a death sentence, and having seen the fate of Parmenian and Philotas. Antipater purportedly arranged for Alexander to be poisoned by his son Iolus, who was Alexander's wine pourer. There was even a suggestion that Aristotle may have participated. The strongest argument against the poison theory is the fact that 12 days passed between the start of the illness and his death. Such a long-acting poisons were probably not available. However, in 2003 BBC documentary investigating the death of Alexander, Leo Shep of the New Zealand Na National Poison Center proposed that the plant white hellebore, uh, which was known in antiquity, may have been used to poison Alexander. In a 2014 manuscript in the Journal of clinical toxicology. Shep suggests Alexander's wine was spiked with hellebore, white hellebore, and that this would produce poisoning symptoms that matched the course of events described in the Alexander romance. For Adam, album poisoning can have, prolonged have a prolonged course, and it was suggested that if Alexander was poisoned, for Adam, albus was, offers the most plausible cause. Another poisoning explanation put forward in 2010 proposed that the circumstances of his death were compatible with poisoning by water of the river Styx, modern-day Mevaneri in Acadia, Greece, that contained calichiminisin, a dangerous compound produced by bacteria. Several natural causes diseases have been suggested, including malaria and typhoid fever. A 1998 article in the New England Journal of Medicine attributed his death to typhoid fever complicated by bowel perforation and ascending paralysis. 
Another recent analysis suggested pyogenic spondylitis or meningitis. Other illnesses fit the symptoms, including acute pancreatitis and West Nile virus. Natural cause theory also tends to emphasize that Alexander's health may have been in general decline after years of heavy drinking and severe wounds. The anguish that Alexander felt after Hephaestion's death may have also contributed to his declining health. After death. Alexander's body was laid in a gold an anthropoid sarcophagus that was filled with honey, which was in turn placed in a gold casket. According to Alien, a seer called, Al called Aristander foretold that the land where Alexander was laid to rest would be happy and unvanquishable forever. Perhaps more likely, the successors may have seen possession of the body as a symbol of legitimacy since burying the prior king was a royal prerogative. While Alexander's funeral cortege was, was on its way to Macedon, Ptolemy seized it and took it temporarily to Memphis. His successor, Ptolemy, Ptolemy II Philadelphus, transferred the sarcophagus to Alexandria, where it remained until at least late antiquity. Ptolemy IV uh, Leoros, one of Ptolemy's final successors, replaced Alexander's sarcophagus with a glass one so he could convert the original to coinage. Huh. The recent discovery of an enormous tomb in northern Greece at Amphipolis, dating, Amph Amph Amphipolis, dating from the time of Alexander the Great, has given rise to speculation that its original intent was to be used as a burial place of Alexander. This, this would fit with the intended destination of Alexander's funeral cortege. Cortege. Pompey, Julius Caesar, and Augustus all visited the tomb in Alexandria, where Augustus allegedly, accident allegedly accidentally knocked the nose off. Caligula was said to have taken Alexander's breastplate from the tomb for his own use. Around AD 200, Emperor Septimius Severus closed Alexander's tomb to the public. His son and successor, successor Caracalla, a great admirer, visited the tomb during his own reign. After this, details of the fate of the tomb are hazy. The so-called Alexander sarcophagus, discovered near Sidon and now near the Istanbul Archaeology Museum, is so named not because it was thought to have contained Alexander's remains, but because of its bas reliefs, de because of its base re reliefs, depict Alexander and his companions fighting the Persians and hunting. It was originally thought to have been the sarcophagus. Vaad Bemhonalis died 311, king of Sidon, appointed by Alexander immediately following the Battle of Isis in 331. However, more recently, it has been suggested that it may date from earlier than Abdemonalis' death. Division of the Empire Alexander's death was so sudden that when reports of his death reached Greece, they were not immediately believed. Alexander had no, had no obvious or legitimate heir. His son Alexander IV by Roxanne, being born after Alexander's death, according to Diodorus, Alexander's companions asked him on his deathbed to whom he bequeathed his kingdom. His iconic reply was, something I'm not going to say, to the strongest. Arian and Plutarch claimed that Alexander was speechless by this point, implying that this was an apocryphal story. Diodorus, Curtius, and Justin offered a more plausible story that Alexander passed his signet ring to Perdiccas, a bodyguard and leader of the companion cavalry, in front of witnesses, thereby nominating him. Perdiccas initially did not claim power, instead suggesting that Roxanne's baby would be king, if male. With himself... Criterius, Leonidas, and Antipater as guardians. However, the infantry, under the command of Melagiger, rejected this arrangement since they had been excluded from the discussion. Instead, they supported Alexander's half-brother, Philip Aridaeus. Eventually, the two sides reconciled, and after the birth of Alexander IV, he and Philip III were appointed joint kings, albeit in name only. Dissensions and rivalries soon afflict, afflicted the Macedonians, however. The satrapies, handed out by 
Perdiccas at the partition of Babylon became power bases each general used to bid, pa- bid for power. After the assassination of Perdiccas at 321 BC, Macedonian unity collapsed and a 40 years of war between the successors ensued before the Hellenistic world settled on to four stable power blocks. Ptolemaic Egypt, Seleucid Mesopotamia, Central Asia, Adelaide, Anatolia, and Antigonoid Macedonia. In the process, both Alexander IV and Philip III were murdered. Must you drink right now, puppy? Thank you. Will. Diodorus stated that Alexander had given detailed written instructions to Criterius some time before his death. Criterius started to carry out Alexander's commands, but the successors chose not to further implement them, on the grounds that they were impractical and extravagant. Nevertheless, Periodicalus read Alexander's will to his troops. Alexander's will called for military expansion into southern and western and western Mediterranean, monumental constructions, and the intermixing of eastern and western populations. It included construction of a monumental tomb for his father, Philip, to match the greatness of the pyramids of Egypt, erection of the great temples in Delos, Delphi, Dodona, Dioam, Amphipolis, Amphipolis, why can't I say that? Amphipolis, a monumental temple to Athena at Troy, conquest of Arabia and the entire Mediterranean basin, circumnavigation of Africa, development of cities and the transplant of populations from Asia to Europe and the opposite direction from Europe to Asia in order to bring the largest continent to common unity and to friendship by means of intermarriage and family ties. We are going to pause for a bit. Well, hopefully this is the final take of the final part. And then it will be uploaded only two days late. How about that? Assuming I can upload it by the end of the day. Anyway, we're on to Alexander's character, starting with his generalship. Alexander earned the epithet The Great due to his unparalleled success as a military commander. He never lost a battle despite typically being outnumbered. This was due to use of terrain, phalanx, and cavalry tactics, bold strategy, and fierce loyalty of his troops. The Macedonian phalanx, armed with a sarissa, a spear six meters long, had been developed and perfected by Philip II through rigorous training. And Alexander used its speed and maneuverability to great effect against larger but more disparate Persian forces. Alexander also recognized the potential for disunity among his diverse army, which employed various languages and weapons. He overcame this by being personally involved in battle, in the manner of a Macedonian king. In his first battle in Asia, at Granicus, Alexander used only a small part of his forces, perhaps 13,000 infantry with 5,000 cavalry, against a much larger Persian force of 40,000. Alexander placed the phalanx at the center and cavalry and archers in the wings so that his line marched the length of the Persian cavalry line, about three kilometers. By contrast, the Persian infantry was stationed behind its cavalry. This ensured that Alexander would not be outflanked while his phalanx, armed with lawn pikes, had a considerable advantage over the Persians, scimitars, and javelins. Macedonian losses were negligible compared to those of the Persians. At Isis in 333, his first confrontation with Darius. He used the same deployment, and again, the central phalanx pushed through. Alexander personally led the charge in the center, routing the opposing army. At the decisive encounter with Darius at Guatemala, no, Guatemala, (laughs) Gagamela, Darius equipped his chariots with scythes on the wheels to break up the phalanx and equipped his cavalry with pikes. Alexander arranged a double phalanx, with the center advancing at an angle, parting when the chariots bore down, and then reforming. The advance was successful and broke Darius's center, 
causing the latter to flee once again. When faced with opponents who used unfamiliar fighting techniques, such as in Central Asia and India, Alexander adapted his forces to his opponent's style. Thus, in Bactria, in Sagdeya, in Sagdiana, Alexander successfully used his javelin throwers and archers to prevent outflanking move movements while massing his cavalry at the center. In India, confronted by Porus Elephant Corp by Porus's elephant corpse, the Macedonians opened their ranks to envelop the elephants and used the Cirruses to strike upwards and dislodge the elephant handlers. Strategic genius, hence the great. Physical appearance. Biographer, Greek biographer Plutarch describes Alexander's appearance as, the outward appearance of Alexander is best represented by the statues of him, which Lysippus made. And it was by this artist alone that Alexander himself thought it fit that he should be modeled. For those peculiarities, which many of his successors and friends afterwards tried to imitate, namely the poise of the neck, which bent slightly to the left, and the melting glance of the eyes, this artist had accurately observed. Apelles, however, in painting him uh, as wielder of the thunderbolt, did not reproduce his complexion, but made it too dark and swarthy, whereas he was of fair color, as they say, and his fairness passed into readiness on his breast particularly, and on his face, and in his face. Moreover, the great pleasant odor exhaled from his skin, that there was a fragrance about his mouth and his, all his flesh, so that his garments were filled with it. This we have read in the memoirs of Aristarchus. <laughs> Sounds rather histrionic. Greek historian Arian describes Alexander as the strong, handsome commander, with one eye dark as the night and one eye blue as the sky. The semi-legendary Alexander romance also suggested that Alexander suffered from heterochromadia iridium, that one eye was dark and the other light. British historian Peter Green provided a description of Alexander's appearance based on his interview review of statues and some ancient documents. Felix, phys physically, Alexander was not pre, pre was not proposing preposit. What the fuck? Physically, Alexander was not prepossessing, even by Macedonian standards. He was very short, though stocky and tough. His beard was scanty, and he was stood out against his hirsute her Macedonian barons by a going clean-shaven. His neck was in some way twisted, so that he appeared to be gazing upward at an angle. His eyes, one blue, one brown, revealed a dewy feminine quality. He had a high complexion and a harsh voice. Ancient authors recorded that Alexander was so pleased with portraits of himself created by Lysippos, that he forbade other sculptures from crafting his image. Lysippos had often used the contraposto sculptural scheme to portray Alexander and other characters such as Epoxiomenos, Hermes, and Eros. Lysippos sculptures, famous for its naturalism as opposed to stiffer, more static pose, is thought to be the most faithful depiction. Yeah. There he is. How about that? Personality. Some of Alexander's strongest personality traits formed in response to his parents. His mother had huge ambitions and encouraged him to believe it was his destiny to conquer the Persian Empire. Olympias influence instilled a sense of destiny in him, and Plutarch tells us that his ambition kept his spirit serious and lofty in advance of its years. However, his father, Philip, was Alexander's most immediate and influential role model. As the young Alexander watched him campaign practically every year, winning victory after victory while ignoring severe wounds, Alexander's relationship with his father forged the competitive side of his personality. He had a need to outdo his father, illustrated by his reckless behavior in battle. While Alexander worried that his father would leave him, no great or brilliant achievement to be displayed out to the world. He, had also, he also downplayed his father's achievements to his companions. According to Plutarch, among Alexander's traits 
with a violent temper and rash, impulsive nature, which undoubtedly contributed to some of his decisions. Although Alexander was stubborn and did not respond well to orders from his father, he was open to reason and debate. He had a calmer side, perspective, logical, and calculating, perceptive, logical, and calculating. He had a great desire for knowledge, a love of philosophy, and he was an avid reader. There was no doubt in part due to Aristotle, this was no doubt in part due to Aristotle's tutelage. Alexander was intelligent and quick to learn. His intelligent and rational side was aptly demonstrated by his ability to succeed and success as a general. Had he, gr he had great restraint in pleasures of the body in contrast with his l lack of self-control with alcohol. Alexander was a Eurydite and patronized both arts and sciences. However, he had little interest in sports or the Olympic Games, unlike his father, seeking only the Homeric ideals of honor and glory. He had great charisma and force of personality, characteristics which made him a great leader. His unique abilities were further demonstrated by the inability of any of his generals to unite Macedonia and, reach and retain the empire after his death. Only Alexander had the ability to do so. During his final years, and especially after the death of Hephaestion, Alexander began to exhibit signs of megalomania and paranoia. His extraordinary achievements, coupled with his own ineffable sense of destiny and flattery, of his, and the flattery of his companions may have combined to produce this effect. His delusions of grandeur are readily visible in his will and his desire to conquer the world. Inasmuch as he, he is, by various sources described as having, boundless ambition, an epithet, the meaning of which has descended into a historical cliché. He appears to have believed himself, believed himself a de deity, or at least sought to deify himself. Olympias always insisted that he was the son of Zeus, a theory apparently confirmed to him by the oracle of Ammon in Siwa. He began to identify himself as the son of Zeus Ammon. Alexander adopted elements of Persian dress and customs at court, notably, not going to say it again, practice, a practice which Macedonians disapproved and were loath to perform. This behavior cost him the sympathies of many of his countrymen. However, Alexander was also a pragmatic ruler who understood the difficulties of, ru of ruling culturally disparate peoples, many of whom lived in kingdoms where the king was, a div was divine. Thus, rather than megalomania, his behavior may simply have been practical attempt at strengthening his rule and keeping his empire together. Personal Relationships Alexander married three times. Roxana, daughter of the Sogdian nobleman, Oxtiartes of Bactria, out of love, and the Persian princesses Stateria and Peristatis II, the former daughter of Darius III, and the latter the daughter of Araxerxes III, for political reasons. He apparently had two sons, Alexander IV of Macedon by Roxana, and possibly Hercules of Macedon, from his mistress Barzine. He lost another child when Roxana was miscarried at Babylon. Alexander also had a close relationship with his friend, general, and bodyguard, Hephaestion, the son of a Macedonian nobleman. Hephaestion's death devastated Alexander. This may event may have contributed to Alexander's failing health and detached mental state during his final months. Alexander's sexuality has been the subject of speculation and controversy. No ancient sources stated that Alexander had homosexual relationships or that Alexander's relationships with Hephaestion were sex was sexual. Alien, however, writes of Alexander's visit to Troy, where Alexander garlanded the tomb of Achilles and Hephaestion that of Pactroclus, the later riddling that he was a beloved of Alexander, in just the same way Patroclus was of Achilles, noting that the word Eromenes, ancient Greek for beloved, does not necessarily bear sexual meaning. Alexander may have been bisexual, which in his time was not controversial. Green argues that there was little evidence in ancient sources that Alexander had much carnal interest in women. He did not produce an heir until very late, until the very end of his life. However, he was relatively young when he died. And Ogden suggests that Alexander's matrimonial rec record 
is more impressive than his father's at the same age. Apart from wives, Alexander had many more female companions. Alexander accumulated a harem in the style of Persian kings, but he used it rather sparingly, showing great self-control and pleasures of the body. Nevertheless, Plutarch described how Alexander was infatuated by Roxana, while, compliment, while complimenting him on not forcing himself on her. Green suggested that, in the context of this period, Alexander formed quite strong friendships with women, including Ada of Caria, who adopted him, and even Darius's mother, Sisygambis, who supposedly died from grief upon hearing of Alexander's death. Battle record. Ugh, look at that. It's like Floyd Mayweather, 1-0, 2-0, 3-0. -0, -0. Only he's just crushing Balkans and Persians. The Indian campaign. Gets up to 20-0. and 0. That's, that's just ridiculous. 20 in a row. No warm-up, just go. No minor league. Legacy. Alexander's legacy extended beyond his military conquests. His campaigns greatly increased contacts and trade between East and West, and vast areas of the East were significantly exposed to Greek civilization and influence. Some of the cities he founded became major cultural centers, many surviving into the 21st century. His chroniclers recorded valuable information about the areas through which he marched while the Greeks themselves got a sense of belonging to a world beyond the Mediterranean. Hellenistic Kingdoms Alexander's most immediate legacy was the introduction of, the Ma of Macedonian rule to huge new swaths of Asia. At the time of his death, Alexander's empire covered some 5,200,000 square kilometers, or just 2 million square miles, and was the largest state of its time. Many of these areas remained in Macedonian hands or under Greek influence for the next two to three hundred years. The successor states that emerged were at least initially dominant forces, and these three hundred years are often referred to as the Hellenistic period. The eastern borders of Alexander's empire began to collapse even during his lifetime. However, the power vacuum he left in the northwest of India, of the Indian subcontinent, directly gave rise to one of the most powerful Indian dynasty in history the Moriori Empire. Taking advantage of this power vacuum, uh, Chandragupta Maori, Maori, referred to in Greek sources as Sandrokotos, of relatively humble origin, took control of the Punjab, and with that power base proceeded to conquer the Nanda, Nanda Empire. Founding of Cities over the course of his conquests, Alexander founded some 20 cities that bore his name, most of them east of the Tigris. The first and greatest was Alexandria in Egypt, which would become one of the leading Mediterranean cities. The city's location reflected trade routes as well as defensive positions. At first, the cities must have been inhospitable, little more than defensive garrisons. Following Alexander's death, Many Greeks who had settled there tried to return to Greece. However, a century or so after Alexander's death, many of the Alexandrias were throughout arriving with elaborate public buildings and substantial populations that included both Greek and local peoples. Hellenization Hellenization was coined by the German, German historian Johann Gustav Droysen to denote the spread of Greek language, culture, and population into the former Persian Empire after Alexander's conquest. That this export took place is undoubted and can be seen in the great Hellenistic cities, for instance, Alexandria, Antioch, Seleucia, modern Baghdad, south of modern Baghdad. Alexander sought to insert Greek elements into Persian culture and attempted to hybridize Greek and Persian culture. This culminated in his aspiration to homogenize the populations of Asia, Asia and Europe. However, his successors, his successors explicitly rejected such policies. Nevertheless, Hellenization occurred throughout the region, accompanied by a distinct and opposite orientalization of the successor states. The core of the Hellenistic culture promulgated by the conquests was essentially Athenian. 
The close association of men from across Greece and Alexander's army directly led to the emergence of largely Attic-based koin, or common Greek dialect. Koin, koine, koin, whatever, spread through the Hellenistic world, becoming the lingua franca of Hellenistic lands and eventually the ancestor of modern Greek. Furthermore, town planning, education, local government, and art current in the Hellenistic period were all based on classical Greek ideals, evolving into new distinct forms commonly grouped as Hellenistic. Aspects of Hellenistic culture were still evident in the traditions of the Byzantine Empire in the mid-15th century. Some of the most pronounced effect of Hellenization can be seen in Afghanistan and India, in the region of the relatively late-rising greco brit Bractian Kingdom, in modern Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Tajikistan, in the Indo-Greek Kingdom, BC, 180 BC to 10 CE, in modern Afghanistan and India. There, on the newly formed Silk Road, Greek culture apparently hybridized with Indian, especially Buddhist culture. The resulting syncretism, known as Greco-Buddhism, heavily influenced the, the development of Buddhism and created a culture of Greco-Buddhist art. These Greco-Buddhist kingdoms sent some of the first Buddhist missionaries to China, Sri Lanka, and the Mediterranean, Greco-Buddhist monasticisms. Some of the first most influential uh, figurative portrayals of the Buddha appeared at this time, perhaps modeled on Greek statues of Apollo in the Greco-Buddhist style. Several Buddhist traditions may have been influenced by the ancient Greek religion. The concept of Bodhisattvas is reminiscent of Greek divine heroes. Some of Mahayan ceremony, ceremonial practices, burning incense, gifts of flowers, and food placed on altars, are similar to those practiced by the ancient Greeks. However, similar practices were also observed among native Indic cultures. One Greek king, Menendar I, probably became Buddhist and was immortalized in Buddhist literature as Melinda. The process of Hellenization also spurred trade between East and West. For example, Greek astrono astronomical instruments during the 3rd century BC were found in the, Breco in the Greco Bactrian city of A. Canuum in modern day Afghanistan. While the Greek concept of a spherical Earth surrounded by the spheres of planets eventually supplanted the long standing Indian cosmological belief of a di disk consisting of four continents grouped around a central mountain, Mount Meru, like petals of a flower. The Yevangelica Greek Astronomical Treatise and Polissa Siddhanta texts depict the influence of Greek astronomical ideas on Indian astronomy. Following the conquest of Alexander the Great in the East, Hellenistic influence on Indian art was far-ranging. In the area of architecture, a few examples of the Ionic Order can be found as far as Pakistan with the genital temple near Texilia. Several examples of capitals displaying Ionic influences can be seen as far as Patna, especially with a Pata, Pataliputra capital dedicated, dated to the third century BC. The Corinthian order is also heavily represented in the art of Gandhara, especially through Indian Indo Corinthian capitals. Influence on Rome Alexander and his exploits were admired by many Romans, especially generals, who wanted to associate themselves with his achievements. Polybius began his histories by remi reminding Romans of Alexander's achievements, and, and thereafter, Roman leaders saw him as a role model. Pompey the Great adopted the epithet Magnus and even Alexander's and a stole type haircut and searched the conquered lands of the East for Alexander's 260 year old cloak, which he then wore as a sign of greatness. Julius Caesar dedicated a Lisbian equestrian bronze statue, but replaced Alexander's head with his own. While Octavian visited Alexander's tomb in Alexandria, and temporarily changed his seal from a sphinx to Alexander's profile. 
The Emperor Trajan also admired Alexander, as did Nero and Caracalla. The, the Macriani, a Roman family that in person, then the person of Macri, Macrinus briefly ascended to the imperial throne, kept images of Alexander on their persons, either on jewelry or embroidered into their clothes. On the other hand, some Roman writer, writers, particularly Republican figures, used Alexander as a cautionary tale of how autocratic tendencies can be kept in check by Republican values. Alexander was used by these writers as an example of a ruler, as an example of ruler values such as emicita, friendship, and clementia, clemency, but also iracundia, anger, anger, and cupiditas glory over desire for glory. Legend. Legendary accounts surround the life of Alexander the Great, many deriving from his own lifetime, probably encouraged by Alexander himself. His court historian, Kelisthenes, portrayed, Kelisthenes, portrayed the Sea of Cilicia as drawing back from him in Pros, Proskinesis. Writing shortly after Alexander's death, another participant, one is Critus, invested a, invented a treaty between Alexander and the, Thalestris, queen of the mythical Amazons. Once one is strictus read the, this passage to his patron, Alexander's general and later king, Lysimachus, reportedly quipped, I wonder where I was at the time. In the first centuries of Alexander's death, probably on Alexandria, a, quaint, a quantity of the legendary material coalesced into a text known as the Alexander Romance, later falsely ascribed to Callisthenes, and therefore known as the pseudo calisthenes This text underwent numerous expansions and revisions throughout antiquity and the Middle Ages, con containing many dubious stories, and was translated into numerous languages. In ancient and modern culture. Alexander the Great's accomplishments and legacy have been depicted in many cultures. Alexander is figured in both high and popular culture, beginning in his own era to the present day. The Alexander Romance, in particular, had a significant impact on portrayals of Alexander in later cultures, from Persian to medieval Europe to modern Greek. Alexander features prominently in Greek folklore more so than any other ancient figure. The colloquial form of his name in modern Greek is a household name, and he is the only ancient hero to appear in the Karagiosis shadow play. One well-known fable among Greek seamen involves a solitary, solitary mermaid who would grasp at the ship's prow during the storm and ask the captain, is King Alexander alive? The correct answer, he is alive, he is alive and well and rules the world, causing the mermaid to vanish and, claim, and the sea to calm. Any other answer would cause the mermaid to turn into a raging gorgon who would drag the ship to the bottom of the sea, all hands aboard. That's a pretty cool myth. In pre-Islamic Middle Persian Zoroar Zoroastrian literature, Alexander is referred to by the epithet Gujaskak. Back meaning accursed, and is accursed of destroying temple, and is accused, and is accused of destroying temples and burning sacred texts of Zoroastrianism. In Sunni Islamic Persia, under the influence of Alexan the Alexander Romance, a more positive portrayal of Alexander emerges. Ferdowsi's Shenmena, the Book of Kings includes Alexander in a line of legitimate Persian shahs, a mythical figure who explored far reaches of the world in search of the fountain of youth. <coughs> Later Persian writers associate him with philosophy, portraying him as symposiums with figures such as Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle in search of immortality. The figure of Dun Quanin literally the two-horned one, mentioned in the Quran, is believed by some scholars to represent Alexander due to parallels with the Alexander Romance. 
In this tradition, he was a heroic figure who built a wall to defend against the nation of Gog and Magog. He then traveled the well-known, the known world in search of the water of life and immortality, eventually becoming a prophet. The Syriac version of the Alexander Romance portrays him as an ideal Christian, as the as an ideal Christian world conqueror who who portrayed to the one true who prayed to the one true God. In Egypt, Alexander was portrayed as the son of Nekdanebo II, the last prophet before the Persian conquest. His defeat of Darius was depicted as Egypt's salvation, proving Egypt was still ruled by an Egyptian. According to Josephus, Alexander was shown the book of Daniel when he entered Jerusalem, which described a mighty Greek king who would conquer the Persian Empire. This city is this is cited as reason for sparing Jerusalem. In Hindi and Urdu, the name Sikander, Sikander derived from Persian, denotes a young rising talent. In medieval Europe, he was made a member of the Nine Worthies, a group of heroes who encapsulated all ideal qualities of chivalry. Irish playwright Aubrey Thomas de Vere wrote Alexander the Great, a dramatic poem. Histri Histriography. Apart from a few inscriptions and fragments, texts written by people who actually knew Alexander or who gathered from information from men who served with Alexander were all lost. Contemporaries who wrote accounts of his life include Alexander's campaign historian, Kelisthenes, Alexander's generals, Ptolemy, Nearchus, Aristobulus, a junior officer of the campaigns, and one is Scritus, Alexander's chief helmsman. Their works are lost, but later works based on these original sources have survived. The earliest of these is Diodorus' Siculus, 1st century BC, followed by Quintus Curtus Rufus, mid to late 1st century AD. Arian, 1st to 2nd century AD. The biographer Plutarch, 1st to 2nd century AD. And finally, Justin, whose work dated as late as the 4th century. Of those, Arian is generally considered the most reliable, given that he used Ptolemy and Aristobulus and Aristobulus as his sources, closely followed by Diodorus. Ancestry, and it looks like we are about done here. Wow. Episode 2 of Wikipedia Wednesday. Two days late. All the dollars short. Way too fucking long. Next week should be on time. All right. As always, praise Keck. If you found this interesting, give me a subscribe. If you agree with me, give it a like and share it with somebody you think disagrees. If you're here and you disagree, please explain why down below and let's try to have an exchange of ideas here. If you want to say anything else, find me on Minds. Yeah.